Jib Talks, Gibraltar's public figures like you've never heard them before. Today, featuring Captain of the Port, John Gio. And the next talk um, this afternoon is the 127th in the history of Jib Talks. So that's 127 speakers, 127 titles, and this is the best one we've ever had. <laughs> and it shows the kind of creative thinking that we need when something bad happens and you want to make sure that the person who is uh, at the top um, thinks a little bit differently. Here to tell us about those times when ship happens, please welcome the captain of the port and the CEO of the Gibraltar Port Authority, John Gio. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Before I begin, I have to point out that we are currently unable to show you all of the footage we have. Uh, there is still an active prosecution case ongoing, but I hope that what we're at, we are able to show you, you, you will still find interesting. Let me take you back to the 29th of August, tw uh, 2022. It's a bank holiday Monday. I'm having dinner at my favorite restaurant to celebrate my niece's performance for her GCSEs. Shortly after 10 p.m., I received the first notification of an ongoing issue in the Bay. Before we go to this, let me introduce the port of Gibraltar to you. Gibraltar is the biggest bunker port in the Mediterranean by volume delivered, the third biggest in Europe and the seventh in the world. As an indication of the activity that goes on in our port, you can see in this video a 200 times sped up video footage showing vessel, vessel movements on the 29th of August. In the 24 hours preceding the incident, we had 58 port calls, including 29 bunker supply operations, 14 crew changes, a container vessel discharging at the port, a small cruise liner with 86 passengers, a ferry bringing, lor bringing in lorries, a containing stock for our supermarkets, as well as many other activities. The Gibraltar Port Authority, or GPA team, is tasked with overseeing these operations, ensuring that the various services are delivered in an optimized and efficient manner with safety and environmental protection being paramount at all times. Add to this responsibility to manage and coordinate maritime movements in and out of the bay and harbor and extending to the approaches to Gibraltar. I mentioned I was having dinner that night at the restaurant and I am able to do this and to relax after hours because of the knowledge that I have that the GPA has a dedicated team of professionals 24 seven on duty and this night was no different. Vessel traffic services or VTS team on duty included our standard complement of two VTS operators and a VTS supervisor. And they have at their disposal an integrated network of hardware, which includes three radars, four specialized pan tilt zoom camera stations with electro-optical and thermal imaging and a host of other sensors, which are used to constantly monitor activities in the bay. More important than the, than the sensors and hardware that we have at the disposal is the dedication and professionalism of the entire team that makes up the Port Authority. This is our biggest asset and this is what makes a difference on a daily basis in what is our very busy dynamic ports. Two vessels in particular called on that night and that is the OS35 and the Adam and Angie. OS35 called to take bunkers and provisions before intending to continue to the Netherlands to deliver its cargo. And the Adam LNG, an LNG gas carrier, took on bunkers before proceeding to Nigeria. At 9.30 p.m. that evening, vessel OS 35 contacted Gibraltar VTS to ask for permission to heave up its anchor. By 10.06, OS 35 contacted VTS to inform that its anchor was away and proceeded to sea. By 10.07, VTS was sufficiently concerned with the maneuver that they were seeing that they direct one of our monitoring cam cameras onto the, onto the situation. I can't go into too much detail at this point, but I can tell you that VTS made the vessel fully aware of the situation that they could see developing. As you can see from the footage, the Adam LNG is not a small vessel at 289 meters long. It will have clear, been clearly visible on the bridge of the OS-35. And critically, Adam LNG is stationary, anchored, and the maneuvering vessel is OS-35. 
I can't show, show the actual collision, but shortly afterwards, short, shortly after this sequence, the OS-35 came into contact with the Adam and Energy. VTS communicated with both vessels, and both vessels initially were unable to confirm they had been contact with the OS-35, insisting that they had not come into contact at all. The first priority at this point from the VTS team, team is ensuring that there are no injuries on board, no damage to the vessels either. Whilst they are doing this, the VTS team continue to monitor all the ongoing activities in the port and the bay as, as the same time as they initiate our escalation protocol contained in our operating procedures. First point of contact in this protocol is our duty senior port officer, in this case, my colleague, David Bincher. He was advised of a possible contact, briefed that VTS was still gathering information, but the situation at that point, and on the basis of the feedback that we were getting, indicated that there were no injuries or damage to either vessel. SPO Pincho contacted me, briefed me, and at this stage, the decision was taken for both vessels to remain in British Gibraltar territorial waters until we could confirm that there had been no damage, no matter how minor, to either vessel. And we also started pre-alerting our contingency plan contacts that a possible incident has occurred and that we're awaiting further information. At this point, I make the first notification to the Minister from the Port, at the same time as VTS are alerting the agents of both vessels and a number of our first responders. As I said, given the information fed back to VTS at this stage, uh, our intention is to keep both vessels from departing and to survey them the following day to see what, if any, damage has, has happened. VTS continues um, communication with, with both vessels. Adam LNG is still trying to establish whether it has suffered contact. OS-35 is telling us they have no damage. And yet, half an hour after the incident, Adam LNG finally confirms that they have sustained contact. OS-35 at that point informs us that they have slight damage. BTS direct the camera to the vessel, and what the camera tells us speaks for itself. Now, note the position of the OS-35 by this stage and also note the imagery of what the vessel is going through. Um, at this point, VTS automatically initiates and activates fully the contingency plans for these scenarios. Tugboats, first responders, sister agency are all, are all notified. I am briefed on this. We start uh, deploying and calling back our staff. We notify the Minister for the Port, the Chief Minister, and we also notify Spanish port authorities. We set up our own spill contingency plan, again, as a precaution uh, in preparation for a worst case scenario. And as things, uh, these things are carrying on in the background by 10 past 11, the vessel has run aground. Now, the vessel runs aground at 17.5 meters of water, 17 and a half meters of water. The vessel, when it arrived and before the incident, had a draft of 10 meters. So, in other words, the water ingress at in this short interval has caused the forward section of the, of the hull to sink more than seven meters in this very short time. VTS get, uh, inform the pilots on duty to go on board and try and get us more reliable information. The pilot's launch is the first one to arrive on scene, closely followed by customs, Royal Navy, and RGP Marine sections who are also notified. And we will shortly see that the first of the initial assets to arrive after the port launch is the customs launch, and that's closely followed by the Royal Navy rib. Two tugs will arrive on the scene shortly afterwards. VTS by this stage are directing the vessel to gather all the crew at master station, carry out a head count. Our first priority is ensuring safety of life, and we want to confirm that all crew are accounted for and are safe. While this is happening, VTS continues to direct for the assets on, on, on scene, and we start getting back some more reliable information. At this stage in the, in the footage, you can see the pilot boarding the vessel in what is a vessel in a precarious position at that point. Again, um, our thanks to everybody who assisted with this. By this stage, we're starting to get first reports. No oil pollution is coming from the vessel. The master of the vessel is confirming that he, he has a stable situation on board. The vessel is not continuing to go down any further and we are starting to have a sizable deployment on scene, which means that we can handle the evacuation of the crew from the vessel if required. 
Our focus now shifts to confirming that the situation is indeed stable and we want to confirm that with our own uh, personnel on board rather than rely on second-hand information. And we also start planning next steps, including trying to anticipate the eventuality of any oil being released from the vessel. We now have the full senior management team mobilized at the BTS Center. We mobilize our harbor staff to support continued mobilization of assets and equipment. As always, and we can always count on this, the entire local shipping community steps up to the challenge. <clears throat> Despite this being a late night, early morning, on the end of a bank holiday Monday, launch operators, oil spill cleanup crew, crane operators, everybody responds to our call. We deploy to a, uh, a GPA bucket superintendent onto the vessel, together with resolved personnel, and we start firming up the inventories of fuels and oils on board and, start, and continue work on determining that the situation is stable within the gravity uh, of what we are facing. At this point, I have to emphasize how important, how crucial it was to have brought the vessel onto shallow waters. The fact that the vessel is lying and run aground on 17 and a half meters of water and consequently that we still have out of water access to the majority of the deck, including to the tank vents and the tank openings for the bunker fuel tanks is a huge contributing, contributing factor in being able to deliver some stability to a critical situation. If instead the vessel had proceeded to deeper waters, I have no doubt that the entire vessel would have sunk with a consequent risk of life to the 24 crew members on board. And additionally, its entire inventory of oils, which at that point was being reported as in excess of 460,000 liters of a mix of low sulfur fuel oil, diesel oil, and lubricating oil would have been vented in an uncontrolled and immediate manner with a consequent environmental disaster that would have entailed. Getting back to the night in question, Chief Minister, His Excellency the Governor, um, the Minister for the Port, and the duty staff at the Gibraltar Government Press Office are all present, are all present by this stage at the instant control room at the GPA offices at Windmill Hill. This sets up an immediate action strategic command structure for the continuing response. The first press release is issued at two minutes past midnight, providing the first report of the situation to the public. GPA staff are called up and deployed to various roles, and we carry on, um, we carry on directing operations, closing down the rest of operations in the port, uh, and continuing with our mobilizations. We are feeding out information in real time to all our other agencies and support companies and assets, as well as keeping Spanish authorities informed. As the situation continues to develop, we have reached the point of stability, whereby the vessel is not deteriorating, no oil pollution is being detected, and the crew are in no immediate danger. The master of the vessel confirms his preference to keep the crew on board at that stage. Four hours after stopping all port activity and with the level of stability that we have now achieved, port operations are resumed where they do not interfere with the ongoing response. Strategic command structure adjourns to the following morning by around 2.30 that night. GPA staff are now split into con a continuing overnight monitoring team with the second team being stood down to take some rest and take over in the morning. I am, I am among the team members stood down at four o'clock that morning. At this stage, we start forward planning and crucially preparing diver attendants to the vessel at first light to gauge the extent of the damage to the hull. And as a precaution, we position and we deploy 400 meters of oil boom to surround the entire vessel. The first full-blown meeting of the strategic coordinating group is convened for that morning at 11.30, with a second SCG meeting scheduled for that afternoon at 5.30 p.m. First tasks in the morning are to carry out the dive team, uh, carry out the survey of the hull of the vessel and to have the first underwater images of the extent of damage. This is crucial as that will determine how we can start planning to extract the vessel from its position at the, uh, at the earliest opportun opportunity. While this is ongoing, we are still carrying out contingency planning, including uh, attending on board and make sure that all fuel valves on board are checked and, in, and we are ensuring that they're closed. We are putting protection covers on all fuel tank vents on deck. Again, if the vessel were to sink and the fuel tank vents come below the water surface, 
water will seep in through those vents and push up the oil, which will then be vented in an uncontrolled manner. Critically, we're trying to determine whether the vessel systems are still operational to the extent where we can pump out uh, fuel from tanks number one, which are located under the cargo hold and the forward section, which has sustained the damage, and move that fuel onto a second pair of tanks, which is uh, contained under at the stern of the vessel, which are still out of the water and in a safer position. At the same time, we, we are starting to work on uh, devising the hull patch or coffer dam, as we call it, to be fitted over the damaged hull section, which would then allow us to reinstate watertight integrity to the vessel and refloat it. This involves detailed measurement of the extent of the damage and fabrication of the coffer dam to that exact size and shape. By Wednesday morning, um, work had already started and the coffer dam was being built. Unfortunately, at 8 past 5 p.m. on Wednesday, 31st of August, as I was chairing a heated meeting with the owners and insurance representatives on the vessel, we get the first notification that the OS-35 has broken its back. First reports start coming in that there is a smell of oil in the immediate vicinity of the vessel. However, no oil is immediately visible. But this development means that our initial plan to fit a coffer dam onto the vessel is no longer viable. As I said, we've already started working on the coffer dam. If this, if the vessel hadn't broken its back, we had the reasonable expectation that by the following Monday, the vessel would have been refloated and taken to Jibdurk to have permanent repairs undertaken. Instead, the situation worsened significantly. We immediately had to evacuate our crew started accelerating plans for a dedicated vessel to attend and remove bunker fuels from the vessel's tanks. Now you can see, don't know if you can make out, but we can see water venting out, the water bubbles coming out. Now this is critical because that's the side of the vessel that did not come into contact with the atom energy. And even so, it has buckled and broken its back and we have water ingress uh, in, at that point. From that point on, uh, we had a, a worsening situation. Fuel started being released from the vessel in significant quantities, and we spent all our time working round the clock to tackle the oil being uh, released. Now, within the negative context, we introduced new technologies to our action plans. And you can see one, one critical example of this, this being a thermal imaging drone footage that's taken at night. This enables us to work 24 seven on oil spill recovery operations. And as an example of how much of a development this is, conventional wisdom has always previously stated that oil spill response can only be undertaken during daylight hours. In our case, we've proven that 24 seven operations are viable and possible. Now this, these efforts together with the, this all out effort by the entire GPA and our collaborating agencies in Gibraltar, all of which have stepped up, as well as the local shipping community, supported by Spanish authorities as well, enabled us to achieve some critical milestones within the negative situation that we faced, such as being able to ensure that all the beaches on the east side were free of oil for the National Day festivities. And it was not an easy task. By this point, many of us had been away from our families for a long time or running on reserves. We had not had eight hours of sleep in over a week. And we knew, but we knew that we had to work flat out to ensure any potential risk to life and to the environment was mitigated to the largest extent possible. I'm very proud to be here today to tell the story. And I would like to thank every single person involved from all the agencies, from the Port Authority and from all our supporting operators um, for the assistance and for the help and dedication that they showed in helping us with the OS 35 operation. Without them, this would have been a very different situation. Now, obviously the situation has not been completed. We are still in the process of removing the vessel and the forward movement from the situation as we see here to where we are now and the eventual removal of the ship would require a presentation all of, its, all of its own. Um, and hopefully if you haven't find this talk too tedious, maybe I can be convinced to come back to our future Jib Talks and go into more detail on that.
In the meantime, thank you for your attention. I hope you found this talk interesting. And crucially, I hope it has given you a better understanding on an appreciation of the crucial work carried out by the Gibraltar Port Authority and in this particular context, the fantastic work of the GPA BTS team. Thank you.